Okay, um, can you hear me? I hope so. <laughs> there's about there's about 50 people online and there's more people joining, um, but I'll just start with introductions, I think. Um, my name's Chris Bigby. I'm the director of the Living with Disability Research Centre. Um, and we've been running, as most of you who have joined us over the year know, uh, a monthly seminar series, um, which has gone online, uh, which has been unpacking primarily the research that the centre has been doing around social inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities and social inclusion of people with acquired brain injury. Um, we've decided to take a, a sort of different uh, approach this afternoon uh, to mark, I guess, the end of an incredibly difficult year in the research world and in the disability service world. And for people with disabilities and their families, it's been a very challenging year. Um, but what we're going to do is to try and focus on, on the future um, in terms of where is policy, uh, where's the NDIS going in relation to particularly people with intellectual disabilities, uh, but more broadly people with cognitive disabilities, and then think about the sort of the research agendas and the research sort of mechanisms um, that are beginning to be put in place um, by the NDIS. Um, and so there's a, we've got a number of speakers and I'll introduce them one at a time as we go. So the aim is that each speaker will speak for um, 15, 20 minutes and then we'll have time to speak to have questions. I think we'll do it after each speaker. If you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box um, and I'll moderate uh, those questions. So you can put them in as you go through, but we might save them up until the end of the person speaking. Um, those of you who work in the field of intellectual disability will be acutely aware that up until now, there hasn't been a strategic advisor around intellectual disability and that the evidence seems to be showing that people with intellectual disabilities have uh, actually benefited relatively less compared to most other groups within the NDIS. Um, and part of that is, uh, is, is because the NDIS really didn't take a lot of account of people who aren't good customers um, and the mechanisms to support them to be good customers really weren't put in place at the beginning. So it was with amazing, um, I guess, a lot of people were very relieved and very pleased with the appointment of Daniel Layton as a strategic advisor uh, about intellectual disability to the NDIS scheme and to the board, I think in particular, um, with a sort of broad uh, ambit to really fly the flag in relation to people with intellectual disabilities uh, and their particular issues within the NDIS which is something that had been happening for people um, with autism and for a number of other groups. Um, so I just want to introduce Daniel very briefly, and then he's going to talk about what he sees as his role and what some of the most pertinent pressing issues are that he might be able to get some leverage with over the coming year or so. So I've known Daniel for a very long time. I first met Daniel when I was doing my PhD and a very novice lecturer doing sessional lecturing at RMIT and there was Daniel in the back row talking away while I was trying to lecture. Um, <laughs> but he was a very good student at the end of the day. That was back in about 1995. Um, and since then he's had a, a, an amazing career within disability services and with intellectual disability services in particular. He was the CEO of, he was, he was the CEO of Inclusion Melbourne. Before that, he introduced active support um, and was the disability uh, leader manager at Jewish Care. Then he went and worked at the Brotherhood running their, developing their LAC program, which was an amazingly difficult, challenging job. Um, then he disappeared into the NDIS bureaucracy uh, and did lots of work on the ILCs. Um, and then he popped out the other end as the advisor uh, for intellectual disability. So Daniel has amazing credentials to play this role. Um, 
So we've got very high hopes of you, Daniel. So over to you to talk a bit about what you see that role to be and what you see the challenges are. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the warm introduction, Chris and I, for all on the call. We're uh, reminiscing about when um, uh, those uh, we first met and uh, whether I was one of the good students up towards the front or I was one of the troublesome students up towards the back. Uh, nevertheless, regardless of whose memory serves us correctly, um, we have um, had a great working relationship over um, a number of decades now, Chris, and it, it's always great to be um, around uh, your work and the, and the work of the centre um, in advancing the welfare for people with a disability. Um, let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet today, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and Chris is right to call out that uh, potentially people with an intellectual disability haven't had as easy a run as some might seem with respect to the scheme. And um, it's long been recognised internally that there was a need for someone to be able to provide high level strategic advice uh, as the scheme you know, adapts its plans and updates its policies and procedures to think about how best to support people with an intellectual disability as part of that ongoing work. So I know that um, typically on these calls, uh, the majority of people are located in Australia, but there are occasionally people from overseas, um, also people who have less knowledge of the NDIS. So I won't assume uh, that people have this great knowledge. And so let me just begin by running through um, the role of the agency and the scheme. I won't go all the way back, although I can recall uh, um, making some presentations alongside one of our later speakers in Professor Bonahady talking about um, getting the scheme off the ground. Um, but as it stands now, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is there to support about 500,000 Australians uh, with a disability of um, uh, a profound um, level of disability that is um, permanent or likely to be permanent um, and where their needs cannot be met through mainstream supports and require additional assistance in order to engage in everyday life. And we talk about social, economic and civic participation. Um, and so uh, as we're here talking about intellectual disability and cognitive impairment, we can reflect on that. And as Chris said, feel free to send through any questions. I'll spend the next uh, 10 or so minutes just talking about the role of the strategic advisor. Um, and then I'm happy to hear from people uh, some of your anecdotes, because I know that the agency is always very good at talking at people, uh, less so about listening to people. Um, so I'd love to be able to hear um, from all of you today. Uh, so the scheme is administered by an agency. It's a, a statutory agency, which means it's a, it's a standalone agency or, or a corporate entity that is owned by the Commonwealth. Uh, it, it hangs off uh, the Department of Social Services and is governed by an act that sets out exactly how the scheme should operate. Uh, there is a, a CEO and four deputy CEOs, one uh, covering the area of participant experience delivery, one for markets, government and engagement, one in the corporate services and finance space and the final um, group is around digital design and strategy and that's where I fit in working within an area or a division called policy advice and research and following after me you'll be hearing from Dr Janice Briggs, uh, Biggs talking about her role leading up the research agenda within the NDIS. So what is the role of a strategic advisor. It's a role that was created uh, many years ago. Uh, the role is to provide high level strategic uh, strategy, policy, uh, technical and subject matter expertise to the agency uh, in uh, designing policy and business strategy for the organisation. Um, and really our, our role is to, to look at advice that works across both short, medium and, and long term. Um, and for me, in my role, looking at how 
we can, to use the jargon, build a world leading NDIS for people with intellectual disability and cognitive impairment. So I do have a very broad remit and I can go and pick up lots of stones and see what's happening underneath. But at the same time, I know that for my work to be effective, I need to be doing that in a systematic way, in a strategic way that aligns to the work that is occurring, um, that's outlined uh, from responding to uh, government inquiries and in more day-to-day -day sense, uh, looking at uh, the annual corporate plan and seeing the work that is coming through as priorities for the scheme to deliver upon, looking at the plan of the minister um, and seeing if there are any changes that might be suggested, say, during an election period, uh, and how to best implement those, looking specifically through the eyes of people with an intellectual disability and cognitive impairment and their families. So really my remit is to provide this sense of strategic and technical advice to inform any key NDIA change programs, uh, to develop recommendations that address issues, um, you might call it uh, an, an own motion so that I can really um, I have some latitude and leeway to be able to consider um, what I might see as emerging issues from meeting with various stakeholders and participants um, to look at, at what sorts of issues might be bubbling along and how we might be able to look to resolve them uh, in a systematic way for participants. Um, I'm also called upon to provide uh, the executive leadership team and the board with policy advice uh, to increase choice and control for people with intellectual disability and um, um, of key interest to this group uh, to also be able to bring expertise and bridge um, some of the, the um, to pull together uh, research and academia to, and to be able to provide the evidence uh, that supports uh, ongoing scheme improvements for people with ID. So um, I've worked together alongside the agency's policy area and also the research area that Janice will be speaking of later on in today's um, research seminar series. So uh, that's a bit around the role. I think it's worth calling out uh, some of the policy context and um, people often look at the NDIS as being the panacea, the one big thing that will fix everyone's problems. And it certainly does go a long way to that. And for those of us on this call who can remember um, working in services over the, the past few decades and the changes that have, that have been brought, um, we are certainly getting closer. But um, the NDIS, whilst it's the largest single expenditure in relation to supporting people with a disability, it is a small part of the overall policy setting, which is headed up through mainstream policy settings, things like access to health, education, justice, and infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure being that classic example where uh, the NDIS might be able to provide a uh, a person with, this, with the skills and training that they need in order to gain employment. But if the uh, ramp onto the ferry uh, down the Brisbane River is not accessible for a person who uses a wheelchair, then uh, they're never gonna be able to gain employment in the city uh, if that's their, their only means of getting to and from work. So we need to give consideration as to how we integrate our work uh, with mainstream policy settings and to be able to, to highlight areas where mainstream policy settings really need um, a rethink or, or just a little bit of a nip and tuck to tidy them up. Then uh, if I think about the, the next layer of policy context is the broader social services policy and in particular uh, thinking about things like income support, uh, employment readiness and the programs and how well they work for people with a disability and making sure that they are uh, accessible and, and available. Um, chief 
obviously within the social services policy is the national disability strategy and work is underway currently on the development of the next 10 year strategy. And I think uh, it's really important to note that when you look at the current strategy from 2010 to 2020 this year, um, it doesn't even mention the National Disability Insurance Scheme because it hadn't been dreamt up. Oh, well, sorry, it had been dreamt up and Bruce will talk about that a bit later maybe, but um, it was not something that was being actively considered within government at the time when the current policy was being drafted. And so it's a really important reset as we work to the next national disability strategy around how much the landscape has changed and how much we need to invest to continue to get all uh, walks of life to understand um, what their role is in supporting people with a disability and uh, you know, clearly a, a great example of that is around segregated or um, inclusive education for young people with disability. Um, getting more into the sphere or certainly into the heartland of where I can uh, freely roam is around work in the NDIS, looking at access, planning, the work of the LACs, the work of early childhood, early intervention. And then there is also the work that is performed by the Quality and Safeguards Commission, uh, their work around provider registration and quality standards that clearly has an interplay with the NDIS, um, but not necessarily controlled by the NDIS. So again, it's around uh, influence uh, in order to shape the conversation and to be able to affect change in a way that is meaningful and understood by, for example, uh, the auditors of organisations so that they understand what it is they're looking for. And I think back to the work that, um, um, that Latrobe has done previously working with offices of the public advocate and, and public trustees uh, and community visitor programs and the like around teaching people um, what are the things they should be looking for when they're visiting a um, residential support service. And so again, very similar, uh, drawing on some of those models to think about what um, we might be able to do to affect change through improving understanding in the quality systems of what a quality service might look like. Um, and um, so there's some work that we can talk about there. Uh, in terms of the role and my immediate work, and I've um, recently been announced in this role, I'm, I'm finishing up um, my previous role um, um, and um, still transitioning across, uh, but my, my primary work for the next couple of months will be around support for decision making. Um, uh, as I think about the kind of where I can place my work in terms of now and uh, to the middle of next year, then thinking about the upcoming work plan for 12 to 18 months and then thinking about longer term strategies. Um, for me, number one is support for decision making. Number two, and probably number two through five, um, will all be related to the um, consultation papers that were released a fortnight ago relating to independent assessment, uh, plan flexibility, um, and um, uh, all of the associated changes that might flow from those decisions uh, subject to where the final consultations end up. So that's um, where my focus is at, at the moment. Um, I have uh, a list of other bits and pieces that I'd like to be able to get to, such as um, accessible communications, um, staff training uh, across the planners, the local area coordinators and the staff in the contact centre um, around communicating with people with intellectual disability and interviewing. Um, there's a whole host of work sitting there under support for decision making, but then looking at things like personal budgeting tools um, and data and reporting and programmatic evidence and thinking about how we can capture, translate and disseminate um, knowledge and data relating specifically um, to and about and for people with intellectual disability. So 
I think I've spoken for uh, and, uh, to keep us on track. Uh, pro there probably just enough time to, to take a couple of questions. Um, Chris, has anything come through? Yep, okay, thanks very much, Daniel. That's a, an enormous work agenda. Um, um, so in terms of questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box. If you want to ask a question, there's two questions from Coral. Um, yes. Who is the chair of, Vic of the Victorian branch of, of ACID, the Association for Intellectual Disability? Uh, she says, will there be a strategy to support inclusive governance for people with intellectual disability in the NDIA? And is there a plan to employ people with intellectual disabilities in the NDIA? I mean, we know that there's, you know, there's a high level of employment of people with disabilities in the NDIA, but how does it stand with people with intellectual disabilities? Um, they're both very good questions. Thank you, Coral. Um, in terms of inclusive governance, the NDIS is um, reshaping some of its approach around working with people with disabilities and, and um, hearing very much from the participant voice. There has been um, uh, work done on revamping the Independent Advisory Council and their reference groups. Um, that work is continuing, but you can read about that on their website and obviously the, the work that the IAC do, and there is an intellectual disability reference group, um, feeds directly up to the board because they provide their report to the board. Um, and uh, when the IAC issue a paper, uh, it uh, um, is then given to the agency to provide a management response. So it is a very strong lever. Um, for action within the scheme and also to be able to identify and bring issues from people with disability right up into the, the centre of the governance structure. Um, I know that the work that the IAC and the subcommittees, uh, sorry, the uh, reference groups take um, very seriously, the approach to hearing uh, the voices of uh, lived experience um, and I know that they don't want to um, engage in any practices that might seem um, to be tokenistic um, but having said that there to my knowledge isn't uh, um, an inclusive governance framework as such in place um, but I've certainly scribbled it down uh, for consideration. In relation to employment of people with ID, um, I don't know the breakdown on disability type within the NDIA. I do know obviously that uh, you can read the results in both the APS um, annual report and in the NDIA quarterly reports as to um, the number of people with a disability and a probably happy to take that um, on notice and, and find some response, but I, I would expect that the number of people with ID to be quite low. Um, having said that, I've uh, had the pleasure a couple of weeks ago of visiting a, an ADE, um, what was previously called a, a sheltered workshop um, in Melbourne, where they've been doing work using augmentative reality. Uh, they have been able to work with people with intellectual disability through wearing um, Microsoft HoloLens, these kind of goggles, um, and using those have been able to increase the range of skills and complexity of tasks that people with ID have been um, uh, able to engage with that they hadn't previously been able to do. That's, that was the first pilot. In fact, um, Bruce might be able to talk about that later because it was evaluated by the Melbourne Disability Institute. Um, the, it's really the first step in a pathway around creating additional and um, I might say more complex job opportunities for people with intellectual disability. Uh, the second uh, piece of work that they've done has been to test remote access and supervision so that people with ID could be wearing the goggles and get placed in a workplace rather than in a, um, a, a segregated environment and be able to call upon a supervisor 
who can see through their eyes, through these goggles, what they are seeing and provide instruction. And that has also worked successfully. They're now beginning to do work around scanning, record scanning. Um, and uh, typically this work is not undertaken by people with intellectual disability. Over 50% of employees within ADEs um, are of low literacy or illiterate and therefore not able to perform record scanning work. Um, the Department of Defence, for example, has over 60 kilometres of records to be scanned. Um, and this work is being performed by other um, people, um, other cohorts. And uh, some very early trials suggest that they can support the growth of literacy by people with ID um, through using these goggles that will be able, that will make it possible for people with intellectual disability to be able to undertake this work. That was the reason for my visit. Um, and I think that that holds really exciting opportunities for, for people uh, to be able to gain work both in the community and to be able to perform um, higher order tasks than is typically expected or open to people with intellectual disability, which is why the, the number of people with ID in this, um, working within the agency uh, is so few because we just don't have those traditional um, roles that have that require you know very low levels of skill okay thank you that's a very detailed answer um there's a lot of questions so maybe try and be a little bit briefer yes uh, sure there's a question from uh, carly hyde in relation to independent assessments um saying what provisions and supports are likely to put in place to allow them to engage with this time limited assessment process this is for people with intellectual disabilities or acquired brain injury so the issue about independent assessment there's a lot of concern out there um, what's happening in relation to these two groups yes thanks carly um they're great questions they're the questions i've been asking as well i am commencing looking at that particular issue on friday uh, clearly there the papers are out for consultation um, and so um, and as i've said only recently moving into this role um, so i'm not preempting anything um, but i do think that um, uh, it's fairly safe for me to say that uh, we need to have more than simply talking points about how we're going to engage in a meaningful way around the issue of supporting people with cognitive impairments through IA. Okay, so there's a number of questions from Faye, who is a, obviously is a long-term parent who's been engaged in, in a lot of work in, in the sector. Um, she's got a number of questions. First of all, she points out the, the, I guess, issue about the lack of really strong independent advocacy as a body for people with intellectual disabilities you know there it isn't a strong dedicated well resourced uh, national advocacy group uh, inclusion australia is growing but it's still relatively very small and under resourced compared to some of the other groups so she says how are you going to ensure that people with intellectual disabilities do have adequate and effective advocacy during planning and on that same sort of but broader theme of of people needing advocacy and support uh, what do you see as the role of the CV, the Community Visitor Program in Victoria, going forward? Um, and how are community visitors uh, able to enter accommodation and review people's support against plans if the plans aren't available um, in accommodation services? Um, and then she finishes off saying, what about the issue of funding to ensure service providers provide adequate training for staff that are providing support to people with intellectual disabilities. I mean, the evidence is that you actually need to have a very trained direct support workforce in active support if you're going to get good quality support for people with intellectual disabilities. And that seems to be being stripped out of the current SIL funding. So there's just a few questions from Faye. Sure. Would you like to take those on? Absolutely, Chris. Um, so the first one around uh, independent advocacy. So advocacy uh, is operated in Australia through the NDAP, the National Disability Advocacy Program uh, that is run by DSS. Um, it is supplemented in many states, including in Victoria and recent announcements by both the WA government 
and the New South Wales government of further commitments to support advocacy, um, independent advocacy within their states. Um, so I'm aware that DSS has been working with all states and territories around understanding what is happening in the advocacy sector within Australia um, with uh, uh, a view to looking at, at where best to invest and, and um, what the outcomes might look like. Again, a lot of this work predates, or sorry, a lot of those programs predate the NDIS and therefore um, well and truly due for evaluation um, and consideration against the NDIS. Um, I'm aware when we talk about advocacy during planning that that is a really interesting question when we think about independent assessment. Um, I don't know about you, Faye, um, but um, I've long felt that the planning in inverted commas, uh, process that has been used by the NDIS to date is not necessarily a planning process. And, and um, we can see that pretty clearly through the disparity that occurs in um, people, participant budgets, um, that people in lower socioeconomic areas are receiving smaller um, plan budgets than people in wealthier suburbs, uh, which says to me that planning, um, as I've long suspected, uh, is really, as we think of it today, is really just a resource allocation game uh, and people know how to play the game. And, and um, Chris mentioned in the introduction that uh, I had worked um, in LAC um, at Brotherhood of St. Lawrence and um, it wasn't very long after I'd started that I had seen some of the first emails that um, on some of the Facebook, Facebook discussion groups that were suggesting that families should give their kids two cans of Coke before the, yeah, an hour before turning up to planning meetings in order to highlight the deficits of their children and maximise their packages. So um, yes, there is a planning process now, but I actually think that it was more a resource allocation process. Uh, I personally um, am of the view that being able to provide clarity to people around a reasonable and necessary budget and then enabling a planning conversation to occur will actually enable true planning to occur with people known by that individual. I mean, my personal um, uh, hope would be that in the future that an individual would be asked how they would like to plan and whether they do that themselves, whether there's a voucher to support them to, to um, plan with either a support coordinator with a specialist planning organisation, uh, you know, thinking of an organisation like Belonging Matters or WACE in WA, um, Crew in um, Queensland, um, and let people actually engage in a process that's meaningful for them uh, and simply be able to, to share with the agency as much or as little as is required to justify the expenditure back to the taxpayer that the funds are being put to the use for which they are appropriated. So I think that shifts the conversation around advocacy. Um, and for reasons of time, I, I'm not going to hop into the ones around uh, shared support accommodation, but I'm happy to, to um, take them up offline because I think there are some questions around um, community visitors being able to look at plans in various locations. So you're not going to attempt to address the current issues that are happening with the SIL funding that seems to be shifting it to attendant care? Well, I think that um, uh, what we need to do is raise awareness and understand, we're talking about research here, that there are activities that have greater value and that are likely to lead to outcomes. And there are activities that are unlikely to lead to improved outcomes for a person uh, or a participant in the scheme. And um, I, I haven't spoken to Janice about what she's going to be talking about next, but certainly one of the pieces of work that um, I've been happy to stick my nose into, um, she's been leading and had a, some of her staff undertaking this work, developing um, partip participant decision guides uh, that are synthesizing the research that are talking about whether um, the research is of high or low quality, that are talking about whether 
the research has then found whether the particular programs or interventions actually added value and could deliver the outcomes that people were seeking. I think that a document like that is really a very intelligent way of sharing knowledge because we will be able to put forward guides for participants around the sorts of supports they might wish to engage with. Um, they can read the, the um, plain language uh, version, but service providers and others would be able to, to draw on the literature sitting behind it. Um, and we can look to skill up the sector uh, and also work with the auditors and the Quality and Safeguards Commission around what are the features of those activities, interventions and the like that lead to people achieving good outcomes. And so I think that there are some levers there that we can use. Um, and I won't talk any more about that because I'm sure Janice will be talking about it next. But um, once we can highlight to people what's likely to lead to a change, um, that they might be seeking and what are the sorts of things you might look for uh, that demonstrate that a particular organisation is doing that work, then I think we can start to have a conversation around what it really costs to deliver. Okay, I'm getting the, I'm getting, Jacinta's telling me to hurry up. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to just ask one or two more questions. Um, I'm on it, Jacinta. Um, Catherine McAlpine, who's the CEO of Inclusion Australia, says that she's aware of the work regarding participant reference, the participant reference group, but not about the IAC and an IDRG. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Thanks, Kath. Uh, the IDRG has um, the... In Intellectual Disability Reference Group has been around uh, for over five years now. In fact, I was once appointed to it. Um, uh, it is a group of approximately a dozen people drawn from across Australia, um, includes um, people with intellectual disability. Um, it includes a couple of family members whose children have an intellectual disability or siblings. I'm not sure that they're all children. Um, and um, it also has a couple of um, people who have worked in the sector or in academia. Um, I'm not uh, actually, I can't tell you who the current membership is. I know that that's currently under review um, and people are nominating as to whether they'd like to serve again and then looking at, at um, filling any gaps that might exist. Um, the work of the, I, of the ID reference group is um, to be able to explore issues uh, of concern as they see, report those to the Independent Advisory Council and obviously those then get reported up to the board. Uh, the work on support for decision-making was actually a piece of work that began with the ID reference group a couple of years ago um, that it was heavily supported by the IAC uh, and is now leading to a whole stream of work and, and um, a consultation paper that is, is due for release in late February or early March um, for the public to, to um to provide feedback on a proposed framework and steps that the agency and the scheme can take to support people to um, be better able and be supported to be able to make decisions. So um, we can see that the, the work of the ID reference group can really have a meaningful impact. Thanks. And that's, I think that's answered Rachel's question from CID, which was about um, what, what, what work are you doing in relation to supported decision making? And it sounds like you're having input into, consult, into a consultation document and some thinking before that is then out for consultation in early next year. Is that right? That's great. So um, thanks for the question, Rachel. Hope all is well up in Sydney. Um, Yes, we are working on a paper that will have a draft framework around support for decision making and also outlining the current state as um, of um, decision making, use of nominees and the like currently within the scheme. Um, and uh, then also starting to outline how we might go about implementing um, the framework. Um, we hope to have that out in late February, um, early March. Um, 
Uh, so yes, keep your eyes peeled and I'm sure um, through Latrobe's, through the LIDS update, people will hear if they're not receiving it for, through other sources. So I might just finish off by saying, uh, Catherine McAlpine just comes back and says, she's concerned that the IDRP hasn't actually met for about seven months and is suggesting it, maybe it does need revamping. And I guess, you know, my concern is that it's been raising issues. I can remember, you know, talking to them about for more than two years and it doesn't seem to actually have got a lot of leverage around supported decision-making. It's taken all this time to sort of funnel through and to become part of the tune review and therefore to get some traction. But I guess that's indicative of the neglect of people with intellectual disabilities within the scheme that, you know, hopefully will now begin to be remediated a little bit. So thank you, Daniel. We have to leave it there, but hang around because there will be more opportunities for questions. There's still some there. Um, so we'll come back to them if we've got time at the end. Sure, thanks, um, Chris. So I'm gonna hand over to, to Dr. Janice Biggs. Janice is the branch manager. Um, I've lost the exact title. That's the branch manager of research and evaluation, I think, in the NDIS. Um, she's only been in her post for a few months. Um, and before, she's a researcher and has come uh, from uh, quite a significant career in predominantly in health research, I think, and in uh, knowledge translation, if I'm right there. So Janice, over to you. And what we're hoping you're gonna do is to provide uh, a sort of overview of what your branch is going to do and how people might be able to engage with it and what type of uh, resources or otherwise might be available um, to seed uh, research in this field. So over to you. Thank you. And uh, just before I get started, I just want to double check a few things. Can you all hear me and can you see the slides? Yeah, good. It's always good. <laughs> it's always good to check that first of all before you kick off, isn't it? So I um, just want to say a big thank you for inviting me here today. I'm really excited to come along and share what we're doing in the um, research and evaluation branch. And just while Daniel was talking, I've taken out a few of the slides around the context of the NDIA. So you won't need to hear that, so, hear that um, um, twice. So um, just really going to focus very much on the role of the research and evaluation branch. Going through, as what um, Chris said, a background to our agenda our current way of working, It'd be really good to go through what we're working on at the moment, some of it you'll be across, some of it may be new to you, and then an opportunity um, to hear from you in terms of the way forward and the ways that we can actually um, work, um, work together. So um, one area that I think is important to us, it's important to the, um, the work that we do with the research and evaluation branch, but you're all aware of the corporate plan and working around um, the six aspirations, which we're, which we're currently um, focusing on at the, um, at the moment, and very much working um, with thinking of the renewed way of engaging with, um, with participants. And independent assessment, as you're very aware, is, is one approach approach uh, to that. So in the research and evaluation branch, we're doing quite a bit of work covering all of those, um, all of those aspirations, as I say, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more in a second. One of the really, really exciting things and what attracted me to this role actually is that um, is how the NDIA recognizes research and evaluation as really, uh, really important. We're not just an add-on. We're not just a, a nice to do um, thing within, within the agency. It's absolutely built within the NDIS Act and it's absolutely built within the um, corporate plan that research and in innovation is critical to the success of, um, of the agency and of our way of supporting uh, participants. That's also been reinforced by the um, Tune Review's recommendation that, as Daniel was saying about um, participant decision guides, that um, 
participants really need a way to actually access good quality uh, research to help them um, inform their decisions around what the supports or services they are going to get. And that's becoming even more critical given that we'll be moving to um, flexible budgets and the like um, further down the line. So very much it's um, really now embedded into the organization. The branch is actually very new and we've only been going a year. So when you think about us compared to the rest of the organizations, we are still the new kids on the block, but you know, a team of 15, we're quite a powerful bunch of 15 and we're getting out there engaging with most um, areas of the um, agency. So um, what's, our, what's our role and what's our, um, our focus? Um, this, this was here really to confirm that we don't see ourselves as an island. Um, we do see ourselves as an internal research and evaluation function that helps us really support operational decision making. And that's essentially what we do. What, can we, what, what evidence can we produce or ascertain to actually support the delivery of the agency? But also being very clear that a good half of our role is also to work with yourselves to actually grow the evidence to actually grow the knowledge base so when we do have a question there's the knowledge base there so we can actually answer the question so uh, we're very much um, engaging with the research sector with the NGO sector and also thinking from a systems perspective um, other other government agencies as um, as well I just threw this slide in while you were um, while we were talking, and I um, don't want to go into it a little bit <laughs> too much detail, but just being very clear that we don't see ourselves as a as a research institute. We don't see ourselves as a as a body of um, or a new university. We do see we do want to see ourselves as um, supporting research into practice and supporting the supporting research in real world situations within the context for um, for our uh, for our participants so our so our area and our focus really doesn't focus on discovery research or, or bench tops or the like we are actually looking at research that can help change practice and policies and that goes back to what Daniel was saying about everything that we're doing is to have an outcome that can inform a decision for the um, for the agency. So this is how we do it, and um, so this is what we do. We essentially see ourselves having a five five areas of focus, of which participants always sit in the middle of what we um, what we do. We are doing work generating. Um, new evidence. We do that either by um, synthesizing existing evidence or by actually collecting, um, um, conducting um, primary um, data collections and primary research. We make sure that we set standards across the agency. That's really important. We are a very big agency. There's, there's um, thousands of us. Um, we're not the only ones that are going to be doing research, conducting surveys, using research, et cetera. We need to make sure that when people do, we're working to the right, um, to the right standards. We do support um, people around the agency to actually, actually conduct some research and it's more survey based. It's the smaller, um, small scale research. Um, and building building capability into doing um, searches and to do um, and to doing a few literature reviews and then how they can actually use the the um, the evidence. Um, we do again. It's working with uh, working with you guys. We do want to bring together uh, new ideas, and we want to then be able to look at those new ideas. How can we use those new ideas in practice? and then be able to trans, um, translate those. And that swings very nicely into action. As, and again, what Daniel was saying, we wanna make sure that everything that we, we create and, and the evidence that's been created can be used in a meaningful way to support our, our policies and programs and our services and, and our support. So we have a dedicated team that work on evidence for action to do, um, to do that. 
So this is a bit detailed, but I thought you may be interested in the structure of the um, of the branch, so you know um, who's who in the zoo. Um, we have um, five teams um, across this. Now sixteen of us. We just um, a new person's just um, started a couple of weeks ago. And that covers, as I say, evidence synthesis and, and, um, and rapid reviews. So doing some good work there. Research programs, and I know a number of you have worked with the research programs team and Lizzie on the call who already works in the research programs um, team. They do um, a number of uh, research projects where they're actually going out and collecting new and primary, um, primary data. We have a very large uh, evaluation team. They don't evaluate the NDIS, that's not their role. They evaluate the programs within the NDIS or the services that the NDIS are delivering. And then finally, we have the evidence um, for action and they, they are predominantly working on um, supporting the development of participant decision guides. Um, to make sure participants um, can access meaningful um, research, re uh, meaningful evidence, and also supporting um, people around the agency being able to um, understand research and making sure that research is translated um, appropriately into, into decisions. And then that's all uh, ring first by the Research and Evaluation um, Office. Now, another slide that I threw in, and I say, I don't want to go through this bit by bit, you'll be very pleased to hear, but I just wanted to give you a sense that when we're actually looking at incorporating research into policy development, we don't just do it on a whim. And this is very new. We're trying to form this structure and it's great actually bringing it here to, um, to this group. Previously, we have actually been just, um, you know, we need to do a piece of policy. Yes, we, we go, go for certain, uh, way down the road and we think about research, what research is saying um, um, do we need to rely on for that particular um, topic, uh, which hasn't always worked as well as it possibly um, could, but that's okay, that's what, you know, that's what um, growing is all about. So we're starting to develop these processes around how we can actually engage with the policy team right up front, actually understand the, um, the uh, problems that they wish to answer and then be able to make decisions whether do we need to do a piece of work internally, um, a small piece of research internally or a, a small rapid review to answer that particular question or do we need to actually um, uh, look externally and commission a piece of work um, that will be able to provide some policy answers and we've done both. And we've actually done both. The smaller policies, um, very easy that we can actually support. The larger policies where we want an element of independence and we want actually the experts in the field to um, support the decision making, we then engage with, um, with uh, providers such as, your, uh, such as yourself. And that's the way that we can then um, support the policy development process. Also within that, we actually work um, closely to make sure that the researchers are sat around the same table as the people who are writing the policy. So our evidence for action team is actually facilitating that process so we can actually then get um, the accurate findings and accurate handover. This is a very new process, but it's something that, as I say, I wanted to share in case you had any thoughts on it. So about our work, you've heard about the infrastructure, just now thinking about our work. We do actually have 18 research and evaluation projects on the go at the, um, at the moment. And that's a bit of a woohoo because that's actually quite a large number for a small team. Some of them are very, very small bits of work, collating a few bits of evidence all the way through to um, evaluation and research projects that have been going six on six months um, to a year. So they do cover, cover a broad range of, um, of scope. In addition to that, what we also take very seriously is, um, is engaging with external research projects as well. Now that may be through accessing um, the NDIS data, or that may be through accessing staff, or actually us partnering on a piece of um, research 
So we're actually working to the same, um, same goal and the researchers are also supporting the questions that we need answered as well as their, you know, the areas that they may focus on. We provide in-kind support um, quite, uh, quite a bit um, once we know that the research is aligned to the N um, NDIA goals and there's a process that we've established to work through that. Here's a little bit more around the participant decision guide. Um, as I say, um, the evidence for action team are now working on, crea uh, working on creating these, um, these guides and um, working through the evidence so we can actually um, um, synthesize or pro provide summaries, I should say, of the evidence that can be then used in an easy to use way by a participant that can help them inform their decision making um, process. So a, number, a lot of work was done behind the scenes in terms of what's best practice for a participant decision guide, how could we actually structure them and how could we actually um, develop them. Now that work is um, complete, we've actually at the stage now we've drafted four of the guides and they are now being tested with, um, with a number of um, participants, making sure that the language is, um, is user friendly and making sure that we're actually um, hitting our, our target. And that's been a fantastic process to be, um, be involved in and has included a variety of, um, of uh, participants. And we're just finalising those. Now we're collecting the, um, the feedback and I won't go through the long governance process in the NDIA about getting approvals. Um, so these are currently our um, research priority areas. And again, I don't think they're going to um, um, blow you away. I think they're quite, um, quite obvious in, in, in lots of ways. So very much across um, um, all participant groups intellectual disability, very important um, within that. But in terms of the subject areas, we're covering home and living, early interventions, employment, engaging with vulnerable groups, participation. We've got the whole independent assessment arm that we're working on as well, markets and innovation, and just finalizing some um, COVID research as well. Now, I have put here, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through it all, but I thought you would be interested, actually, if I listed all of the projects that, um, that we're working on and how we're actually, the work we're doing internally, and then the work that we're actually doing, um, external, uh, ex external providers are, um, are doing as well. And then always with the view is our so what. That's always the um, our North Star. So what? What are we going to do with this, um, this research? How are we going to use it for policy, operational guidance, and participant um, decision guides? So I just a few seconds. Okay. We'll circulate the slides as we usually do. So if people have missed it, then we'll, you can pick it up when we, when we make them available. Thanks, Chris. Yes, I just didn't want to go through one by one. Um, but we, we're very aware, you know, as, aside, we say we're very new. There are just massive gaps in the evidence, huge gaps. And um, just showing you the gaps that I thought of, you know, they're so glaringly obvious, really. Uh, we know that there are big gaps in the individualized, um, sorry, the SDA and home and living um, area. We know that there are still gaps with, um, with autism and, you know, employment um, in, across, uh, across a number of areas. We know there are gaps where we understand the workforce, innovative practice, capacity building, more around the support, health and well-being. And again, across all disability groups, all age groups, and all community groups. So here, we're just recognizing that the amount of work that still um, still can be done, um, working together, um, working together on this. And then I haven't covered everything. I've covered off things that we talk about at the at the office that we need more evidence in. So. Um, these are just some of the areas that we are. We know that we have um, we have gaps. 
So moving forward, we've got our current projects. These are the things that I'm actually scoping now across the, um, the agency and, and talking to um, the exec about in terms of um, what, are our, what, what we see the research priorities are for um, the next year and, and beyond. By no ways are we going to be able to do all of this um, internally. This is more of a we know that the, these are say where the gaps in the evidence and these are the, uh, the areas that we want more evidence in. The more evidence that we can have in these areas, I, I think that you know the happier we will be. And again, they're very much focusing on home and living, digital technologies in the um, in the home, social inclusion, capacity building support. Um, uh, intensive programs for children, um, which is something an area of the agency is looking at, broad systems research, and then more broadly, if, um, evaluation frameworks, consistent evaluation frameworks. So I think that uh, it is really important, given the amount of research that um, that needs doing and um, as I say it's a bit of a wish list I thought I'd share my wish list with you all um, um, and the amount of work that's underway just reiterating the importance that we all need to work uh, work collaboratively so you know currently partnering with the NDRP and Bruce will talk um, a little bit more around that and the really important role about how we can actually broker between the um, um, the policy de decision makers and the academic sector. So I think that's going to be really important. And also other academic and other organizations as well. It's really important that we are all working on this um, um, together and we are engaging. We do share. I think it is really important that, you know, uh, Daniel being very clear around, you know, these are our current policy issues. These are our future policy issues. So again, the, we're all heading in the um, in the right direct, uh, direction, and also engaging with um, engaging with our participants and getting a real sense of uh, what's happening in the real world, and their their current needs. So I think it's important that we work together to actually bridge this gap. And then um, it'll be great to talk about this um, a little bit, uh, a little bit more as we move towards more of a co-production approach to um, to our work. I think it's great to have more sessions like today, and if you have me back, um, so we can keep up to date with uh, what you're doing. And and likewise, um, working closely with the NDRP, uh, looking at how we plan. For, um, for research and what that plan is. And I'm not going to talk any more about that because um, Bruce will talk about that and the work they're doing. Um, keep up to date with your research agenda, what, you, what you've got on the cards at the moment. And another piece that we're doing is aligning to the Productivity Commission's Aboriginal People's Evaluation Framework, which is another short-term action from us. So that was it from me. I think I've done 10 or 12 minutes just running through the um, research and evaluation um, branch. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. That's been a, a really good overview and we'll study the slides. I think people will study the slides in detail. Um, sorry, a... sorry, just Chris, just on that, because I knew that you'd want the slides. What I've actually done is I've put at the back um, just so you know, this isn't for conversation, really, because it's just too detailed around the data that we collect, because I think it's important that you also know the data we'll collect. So I'm just letting you know when I circulate the slides, there's some information on our data items that we collect. That's fantastic. Thank you. It's, it's really heartening, I think, um, you know, a number of us have been researching in this field for a long time and had high hopes that the NDIS would would have a big research component and I think it's taken this long for it to really focus on research and it's really good to hear your your strategy sort of going forward. I guess one of the things that concerns me a little bit is you know at the moment the National Disability Research Partnership as Bruce will talk about is in its very early stages and it's by no means representative of the researchers across the, the field. Um, I think that's a bit of a danger that you see that as representing all the researchers and certainly because it's, you know, it's very early days for it, I don't think it can claim to do that at the moment. So 
but I know you're talking to to universities across the board that have mm. track record in this area so you know mm. it's really good um, that this is is growing um, I've just lost the screen hang on so there's a number of questions um, uh, Coral uh, asked the question, uh, has there been, uh, why has there been such a low take up in evidence-based practice in the intellectual disability services sector? Um, and I guess I'd like to add to that in terms of when you talked about evaluation, did you mean evaluating services that are funded by the NDIS or the, fund, the services that NDIS actually delivers directly like planning? Because that may answer um, Coral's question. Yeah, look, I mean, it's the services the NDIS delivers. So what do we actually do? Um, or what, what are our services that we are currently um, currently running at the, um, at the moment? And in terms of the actual, the second part around the um, take up of um, the intellectual disability research, it's something that we're very aware of. And that's why I say we have a team that can actually go, go through this and make sure that the research is being used and being used well, because before, before that, and before we had that skill set, it probably wasn't being used as well as it, as it should be. Okay, thank you. Um, I think some of the other questions have, have, have sort of, you've, you've touched on them and I think they've been answered. There's an interesting one from Emma. She says, regarding research priorities and opportunities for the agency, in relation to capacity building in both disability services and mainstream health, what's the appetite for and the opportunities to pursue initiatives um, in the interface between disability and health services and presumably within disability and other interface services like, uh, like justice? Um, how do you build, what's your sort of, uh, what's on your agenda then in terms of building capacity in mainstream services? Is that part of your research agenda or is that handed over as part of the ILCs now? Yeah, look, it's a really good, um, it's a really good question because there is a fine line of what is a, what is a disability research and focusing on that and then what is um, health research or justice research um, with people with, uh, with disability. That's why one of the areas that we actually do want to start looking at is more of a systems. Uh, research so we can actually look at how we're working with other sectors and I think that's going to be really important because we haven't done it um, done it yet and it's something that we do actually need to um, need to look at so there isn't so people with disabilities don't fall down through a void essentially where we're focusing solely on um, um, areas and uh, mainstream areas of disability and health are focusing on mainstream areas of health or education the like or um, or justice the like we it would be great actually moving forward and I'm very happy to talk further about that um, that idea Emma about how we can actually pull our thinking um, together so we don't have people with disability that do actually fall down that void and I'll just, I'll just summarize one more question uh, which uh, it's from Anu who works in early childhood, uh, but I think it goes back to that issue about trying to build the capacity of people to understand uh, what evidence-based practice is and therefore to be able to choose that. Um, and the difficulty that at the moment NDIS funds are being used to fund non-evidence-based interventions. And I guess the other part of that question is there's a number of researchers that are translating research into evidence-based resources, into guides for um, providers and guides for consumers. Um, and I, I just wonder how you're gonna coordinate the work that you're doing with the participant guides um, with the other work that's happening in the field. For example, we're funded by the NDIS Safeguard Commission to provide guides to what good practice looks like mm -hmm. in supported accommodation. So. How are you going to avoid that sort of duplication and get this material out into the field? Yeah, and it was one of our areas. It was the next um, next on the um, on the list of things to actually look at with participant decision guides. Is you, we, although we are actually creating some of our own, is to also then look at the good quality guides that already exist. Because you're right, we don't want to we don't want to duplicate what you what's already been done. 
and um, and start um, seeing if we can access those guides and start linking them through. So we have a um, coordinated um, coordinated approach. We are just um, it's something that we'll probably pick up um, next. Well, be next quarter because I know the team are already starting to look at which area is actually producing really good um, um, guides and then be able to look at the ways that we could actually logistically be able to do that, be able to use and access um, already existing um, existing guides. So hold that thought, Chris, because I think that we'll be in touch. It's something that we are thinking about. We're just having to go, as I say, we're so new and it's a great, this is really great. That's why we wanted to have this conversation. We're just having to pick them off bit by bit by bit. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. I might uh, leave it there and we can come back to some of the other questions, uh, but I think most of them were answered. Um, thank you very much, Janice, and please uh, stay. Um, we might just take a minute break while Bruce, uh, while we get the slides up uh, for Bruce and then I'll introduce Bruce. So just take a minute to stand up and have a stretch and we'll be back shortly. So, David, you're going to operate the slides for Bruce? I hope, certainly hope so, Chris, and I've got the <laughs> thumbs up from David, so <laughs> this is very encouraging. So you can see them? I can see them, oh, yes, good. it's fantastic. Yep. Okay, sometimes it's, it sort of takes over your whole screen and then you can't see what's going on. Uh, um. No, I can still see you and I can still see David, so <laughs> I can, and he hopefully can see me when I sort of say next slide, so... Terrific, yeah, thank you. All right, so if you might go to, um, keep it to 15 if you can. I will, yeah, I will certainly try that. So just let me know when you'd like me to start and um, and I'll, I'll try and keep it um, short and sharp. Yeah, no, we, we've still, we're only a little bit over time, so it's fine. <laughs> All right, we'll just start again in about two minutes, a minute. Excuse me, David. Hi, Diamond Clear here. Are you happy for me to operate my own slides or do you want me to send them through? No, you, you can do your own die. There was just a problem with Bruce's uh, connection, I think, that was very slow. Yeah, I, I said to press the... I tr tested it this morning and I, when I pressed change slide, it took about 30 seconds for the new slide to come up on Zoom, so... I decided that that wasn't going to work very well. No problem. Okay, so we might start again. Um, if you're back, uh, there's about 80 odd people online, so there's a significant audience. Um, so I'd like to introduce Bruce. Um, most of you have met Bruce or heard of Bruce or seen Bruce, who uh, has played a significant role in the development of the NDIS and was the inaugural chair of the board. Um, and has been at Melbourne University for the last couple of years um, running the Mel Melbourne Disability Research Institute and has uh, developed, uh, been the sort of, I don't know, I think probably the significant lever behind this National Disability Research Partnership, um, which, which hasn't, had a lot of, hasn't had a lot of broad understanding uh, amongst either the researchers or uh, people out in the field. So I've asked Bruce to sort of speak today really about um, where did this originate from, uh, what's the expected role that it's going to play, and how does it relate to uh, other res to research centres such as ours and other, research, uh, uh, other researchers and other research groups. So over to you, Bruce, to give us a sort of rundown of this uh, new exciting uh, partnership. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you very much for inviting me to present today. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all of the lands on which we are meeting today and to pay my respects to their elders past, present uh, and emerging. And I, I must say, I think it's been, I feel very fortunate to be a part of this panel and to have heard the two presentations that 
preceded me. I've known Daniel for a long time and I've been a great admirer of his work, particularly at Inclusion Melbourne. And if he can uh, under ensure the same level of transformation at the NDIA in relation to intellectual disability as he achieved at Inclusion Melbourne, it'll be a great benefit to all people um, with intellectual disability. And my two sons um, happen to have uh, intellectual disability. And I think then to hear from Janice about the, re the research and evaluation that a program that's developing at the NDIA, I think it, it does represent a very significant uh, development and something that we all hope would emerge as the NDIS um, creates this great data set and then that creates this uh, enormous potential for research. And I hope you get um, a similar sense of excitement and potential um, from the presentation I'm about to give on the National Disability Research Partnership. I'm going to begin by talking about its aims and its vision, uh, give you some background, you know, how it came about, um, then talk about how it's positioned relative to the National Disability Strategy, which has been referenced today, the NDIS, the NDIA Research Agenda talk about some our preliminary thoughts about some critical success factors for the uh, for the partnership and then talk about the program of work over the next uh, couple of years because for this to be successful it has to be truly inclusive and so there will be an opportunity for really any researchers who want to join it to become a part of it so David could we just go to the next slide so our aim is to establish a world-class disability research and policy hub. I think in many ways, the NDIS uh, represents a world best practice reform, as does the National Disability Strategy. But in order for those initiatives to realise their potential, it's very clear that we need a level of research and evidence. And uh, one of the ways of, of delivering that is through um, the sort of research hub that is envisaged through uh, NDRP and with a clear focus on improving the lives of people with disability and their families and carers. So it's very much about applied research, practical research, transformational research uh, for people with disabilities uh, and their families. So the background, David, if I just go to the next slide, is that uh, at the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019, Professor Anne Kavanagh, who's the academic director of the Melbourne Disability Institute and I, um, uh, led a proposal to the Medical Research Future Fund through their so-called Frontiers Round, where we proposed this idea of a national disability research partnership. They at the time were looking for uh, world leading ideas that could lead to jobs and growth. And we, our uh, proposition to them was that the NDIS filled um, those uh, key attributes had that key uh, potential. In the end, um, they decided to uh, really not to fund uh, our proposal, uh, but to fund um, uh, proposals very much focused on clinical improvements, uh, medical type research projects. Um, but in the process of preparing that uh, proposal for a National Disability Research Partnership, we reached out in a very short period of time to to different universities, to governments, uh, including the Commonwealth Government through the Department uh, of Social Services. Is, as you know, with these sorts of bids, they get put together in in in, in very compressed timetables. And um, so the people, that, the groups that form part of that uh, initial uh, proposal, it's not envisaged that they uh, will necessarily be the groups that form part of the partnership uh, going forward, that if it does reach the sort of potential we hope for it, it will be open to all uh, research groups. So to your earlier points, uh, Chris, um, this is not to be meant to be exclusive, it's meant to be inclusive, and we certainly don't purport to represent anybody uh, at this point other than this aim of creating a, a partnership, and one which we hope will attract very significant uh, additional funding for disability research. So we've now seen uh, the, the establishment of a research uh, initiative within the NDIA. It's now getting, I think, $5 million per annum from the evidence given at Senate estimates. Um, we need uh, a similar or indeed larger 
in my view, uh, level of research funding externally um, to drive the sort of uh, reform that I think is needed for the NDS uh, in particular, but also the NDIS uh, to reach uh, its its potential. Um, so if you now, um, go to the next slide, I think you'll see that one of the things that was clear from the outset was that this could not be seen to be just a Melbourne Disability Institute uh, initiative. So we've uh, approached uh, a number of people to join our NDRP working party. Uh, and a few months ago, we uh, widened um, uh, we went through an expressions of interest process to attract uh, a number of people with uh, disability, and some further people, I should say, with disability uh, to the working party. So what you see there is the list of the people who currently form um, our working party. Um, and we're sort of actively engaged in a very uh, comprehensive research uh, work program, which I'll um, elaborate on uh, in a few minutes. The next slide um, is our um, shows the sort of policy context in which I think the NDRP could play a very key role. So we obviously have um, the National Disability Strategy, and um, it's pretty clear that when you look at the last disability strategy, the one that ran from 2010 to 2020, one of the clear weaknesses in that strategy was the lack of uh, any clearly defined uh, outcomes, very limited uh, accountability. Um, and one of the things that um, the sector is clearly pushing for is that the next disability strategy has got clear outcomes, clear accountability. And in order to, um, it's going to be, in order for those outcomes to be achieved, it's going to be necessary uh, for two things to happen. One is we're going to need data uh, and linked data, and there is a separate initiative underway that some of you will be, will be aware of for a national disability uh, data asset that's going to link uh, not just uh, NDIS data, but SDAC data and other data to uh, social security data, to tax data, to employment data, to education data, justice data. So there is the potential for the national disability strategy to be backed up by a very comprehensive uh, data set. But what is also clear is that um, in order to close the gap between the outcomes that will be being achieved initially and the outcomes that will be the desired outcomes in the national disability strategy, there's going to be a need for research. And uh, one of the potential roles for the National Disability Research Partnership is to undertake uh, some of that uh, research. It is clearly research aimed more at the national disability strategy. There will be some aspects of the research agenda we think that will be NDIS related, but uh, as you would have gathered from Janice's comments, we're working very closely with the NDIA to make sure that um, there's not a duplication between the research that they will do uh, and the research that might take place through uh, the NDRP. Uh, we uh, don't have at this stage quite the same uh, level of engagement with the Quality uh, and Safeguards Commission, but clearly that's something that uh, is desirable if overall we're going to avoid uh, the sort of duplication to which uh, you referred, uh, Chris. So I think about this as sort of big building blocks and with the potential for the NDRP to play a key role uh, as part of those building blocks for the overall uh, national framework for disability policy and practice uh, in Australia. So if we just now go to the next slide, um, we think that for NDRP to be successful, it needs to be world-class. So um, it, in order for that to happen, we think that there's not only, there's gonna be a need for some capacity building as well as for this research um, partnership to actually undertake research. It's gonna to need to be independent it's going to be trusted, needed to be trusted uh, and responsive. And I note from Janice's comments, the you know the emphasis that she put on uh, timely research, and then above all, it's going to need to be appropriately resourced. It's got to be resourced in a way commensurate with the sort of uh, 
disability programs that we now have and the sort of gaps that exist between outcomes today and the desired outcomes that I think we all uh, are seeking. If we just go to the next slide, we have a two-year uh, research plan. Um, it's the, the key elements are to develop a future governance model for NDRP. So the current governance arrangements are that we are operating, when I say we, the Working Party and the Melbourne Disability Institute are both operating under a grant agreement that we have from the Department of Social Services uh, on behalf of the Commonwealth Government. So ultimately, um, Anne and I are accountable for uh, delivering on this uh, two-year plan, but as I've indicated, we uh, have established this um, widely representative uh, working party in order to uh, make sure that we are, from the beginning, both collaborative uh, and inclusive of people with disability. The second thing that we uh, are there to do is that we need to um, map the relevant uh, research capability uh, in Australia. We're going to develop a practical guide to disability inclusive research. We're going to undertake two uh, pilot programs uh, and we're going to, uh, we've been asked to facilitate some international research partnerships uh, and collaboration. The other key um, element of this two year plan is to develop a 10 year uh, research agenda. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, David, if you just go to the next slide and just skip over that. And we'll just go to what we're uh, doing. So the first thing that we're doing is developing a national disability uh, research agenda. It builds on the uh, work of the audit of disability research that was first done in 2014 and then uh, updated uh, in 2017. This research agenda is being led uh, by the University of Sydney, which is very leading a very large consortium of uh, other universities, research institutes, um, disabled people's organisations and uh, service providers. Um, and you can see the, um, the sort of four distinct phases of this um, research agenda development. So there's a mapping going on now of uh, sort of current research. Uh, there is a consultation that will take place uh, from early next year. Uh, then there will go through a process to sort of prioritise um, the research agenda uh, and then hopefully uh, produce a document in the middle of next year that will inform um, the next uh, 10 years of uh, disability research uh, in Australia. I mean, I, I want to emphasise that it will be will inform, we wouldn't um, uh, sort of assume that what we come up with here will define it, but we hope, certainly hope that it will be a very um, influential document. We think it's very important that the future uh, of the disability research is framed within this sort of long-term research agenda. We also think it needs to be framed within uh, and be cognizant of uh, sort of what research is, is being undertaken so and what has been done so that uh, we don't end up duplicating um, research that's already done or research uh, that is uh, underway. We can just go to the next slide, David. Um, as you can see here, the very large list of um, partners for this um, partnership and uh, the slides will be available and you can look at it um, on those, uh, on those, uh, on the, when, on, on the, the website when uh, this becomes available. So we just go to the next slide, David. So the next um, uh, consultation process that will take place will be uh, from early next year on the future governance model uh, for NDRP. Um, we have, we're close to finalising a governance uh, issues paper that will be um, published in January. Uh, there are a series of questions embedded in that document and we'll then undertake a survey um, to enable people to respond uh, to those questions, plus provide additional advice in what we hope uh, will be a highly efficient way. We'll also be undertaking webinars with key stakeholder groups, with uh, people with disability uh, and their families and those organisations representing them, uh, with uh, 
you know, with the disability industry or the industry industry, uh, and we'd like to strike as um, we think about that more broadly than disability service providers. We want to extend that out into you know technology companies, uh, uh, organisations interested in housing, and some of the mainstream services that people with disabilities uh, need to uh, need to access. Uh, and then we'll also consult with uh, universities, uh, particularly with a view to identifying uh, potential university partners, uh, and then with governments because. Um, all governments have an interest in this. It's not just um, the Commonwealth government. Uh, and then um, based on uh, that feedback, um, we'll then um, either try and seek to identify a, pro, you know, a uh, preferred governance model for NDRP. The paper we've written um, includes um, more detail on what we think the critical success factors are, the scope of NDRP, the funding arrangements and governance, because at the end of the day, you can't separate scope, governance uh, and funding. So though all of those three issues are, are touched on uh, in this paper, but with a principal focus uh, on the governance model. So just the next uh, slide, please. Um, look, at this point, um, we've uh, drafted some potential governance objectives, good governance, a balanced and skilled board. And let me make clear that in talking about a balanced and skilled board, lived experience of disability is clearly identified as one of the skills that will be necessary on the board or on the governance committee of, of the of whatever drives the NDRP. We need to be inclusive, um, particularly of people with disabilities and their families. There needs to be some flexibility in the governance arrangements. When we look at, we've done an extensive review of other national research initiatives. And one of the things that comes out very clearly is that those governance, the governance arrangements for those organisations have evolved and developed uh, uh, as time has passed. Uh, and so some flexibility is needed. And uh, ultimately, uh, this uh, part of the governance need is a commitment to diversity uh, and broad based. We've essentially considered two, um, identified two models that are now common. One is a separate legal entity. So an example of that would be AHURI, the Australian Housing and, Re and Urban Research uh, Institute. But then there are other examples where it's really much more a consortium of partners, which then leverages off uh, existing university infrastructure and ARC centers of excellence uh, would be an example of that. But we don't want to confine uh, the discussion to just those two models. So there's scope in the paper for uh, anyone who's responding to our, um, our, our issues paper to put forward alternative models that they think would be better able to drive the sort of success we're looking, for, looking at or hoping for for NDRP. So David, the next uh, slide, please. Bruce, Bruce yeah. can I just, uh, we're, we're not gonna have enough time for Di, if you- Yeah, I'm just gonna say. quickly say, look, here's the uh, consultation plan. And look, I'm quite happy to um, hold it there and just put the, um, in, you know, the rest, the rest of the stuff can all be looked at uh, online if that's what people would like to do. Could you just maybe go to the slide about the APO initiative, which I think is... Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Good. So one of the initiatives that we've um, uh, we've already put in place, we're about to put in place, is that the we've asked the APO to establish a disability research collection, and that's going to be launched in the next, next couple of weeks. Um, so there'll be a point at which um, we're publishing uh, or they're publishing information on uh, new disability research in a single spot, which we hope will be of um, benefit to everybody who's got an interest in disability research. Okay, thanks. That, that's a very comprehensive view. And I think that's probably provided a lot of background um, that was missing for people. That's great. Uh, there's one question we'll do and then we'll go to die. Um, it's from somebody who's anonymous, but probably is a provider. It says, what's the role of disability service providers in this model that you're developing? Yeah, so look, we think that there'll be, um, we, 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 in terms of thinking about partners in all of this, we certainly think that um, industry partners, um, we, you know, we hope that this will be attractive to um, industry partners, uh, as well as universities, as well as uh, governments. One of the things that we 
people think is very important is that this, uh, for NDRP to be successful, it must have diverse um, funding sources. You know, to be totally reliant on government, um, I think is, uh, you know, sort of, raises all sorts of questions, I think, about the potential, the independence of NDRP, the sort of priorities it might uh, might need to set, and so, and also the sustainability. Um, you know, government, um, I think, will be incredibly important. We'll likely be the major funder of NDRP, but we would like industry partners, we would like, you know, other universities, to, we'd like universities to join, and we'd also like, we also want to recognise the role of disability people's organisations and the resources that they bring in kind to an activity such as this and the, and their role therefore as partners uh, in a project like this or in an initiative like this. Okay, I, I think one of the issues for universities given the dreadful year that most universities have had this year in terms of shedding staff and lacking support from the federal government that it, the universities are going to go through a really difficult patch for the next two or three years and very few are going to have money to invest in anything other than core business um, so i think that might influence some of the thinking about what what the model might be and the, the ability of, organ of of universities large and small to invest in something like this um, which wasn't something that clearly was foreshadowed um, you know when this set off um, but might be very important to future discussions um, but what I'd like to do now is just hand over a minute, to hand over to, to Di Winkler, who, um, who leads a very successful um, research program at the Summer Foundation, which is a, a you know, a non-government philanthropic body, um, which has a partnership obviously with, with La Trobe. But I think it would be very important just to hear from Di about the research agenda that they run and how, how that operates too. Um, so over to you, Di. Every, sorry, everybody's aware of Di. She's the CEO of the Summer Foundation, just in case you're not aware. Sorry. Um, okay, over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. I'll just see, make sure you can see my screen and hear me before I start. Good. Um, yeah, so th thanks for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Um, so the Summer Foundation has a really productive partnership with the Living with Disability Research Centre and we've been working together since 2014. And over the past two years, we've established a new research program and a wonderful team of researchers that, that all um, that mostly sit uh, at the Summer Foundation, but they're all associated with La Trobe University. We work really closely with Emeritus Professor Jacinta Douglas, um, but we've also established a range of other partnerships um, with universities and research institutes because we have a really ambitious research program and we want to um, I guess get it, research done as efficiently as possible so we, we um, partner with a range of other researchers across Australia. So this afternoon I'm briefly going to talk about um, just a little bit of background of, around the Summer Foundation and how it relates to research, talk about our research program, our progress and just a little bit of um, what's next. So um, some foundation's mission is to solve the issue of young people living in aged care. And so that's kind of critical to thinking about our um, research program. So um, at the Summer Foundation, research is just one of the five tools that we used for um, changing the systems that um, admit young people into aged care and leave them there. So um, in addition to um, research, we have a, a lived experience um, team, um, we employ people with disabilities, we develop um, prototypes and potential solutions, we have a policy team, and we're really committed um, in all the work that we do to um, share, capturing the knowledge um, that we're learning and sharing that um, uh, freely um, through resources um, that are available on, on our website. So with our research program, um, most of our research falls into three categories. So we complete um, scoping reviews to really understand um, the, um, each problem and make sure that we're building on previous work. We glean all the insights we can from administrative data. So we've been doing a lot of um, uh, analysis of administrative data over the last couple of years. Um, and, be, and I guess partly that's because primary research is really expensive and um, longitudinal studies take a long time. So we want to um, be as efficient as possible by making the best use of 
the data that is, is available, but we do complete um, primary research and that's to evaluate pilots and prototypes and also evaluate the impact um, of the NDIS. So our research program is really kind of based on looking at the systems that admit young people to aged care. And so um, most young people enter aged care from the hospital, but some do enter um, aged care from home. So our research therefore kind of focuses on all of the, the sectors um, involved in that system. So it does include research into health and aged care and the NDIS and housing. And um, Janice referred to kind of systems research before. So our research program focuses on de developing an evidence base um, to understand the systems and um, potential solutions for systems change and, and looking at the, the policy change that, that is needed, particularly in the interfaces between um, the different systems where um, people with disability fall through the gaps. Um, and I guess in response to Emma's question earlier, um, so we are doing quite a bit of uh, research in the health disability space uh, and the kind of interface. So specifically, we've got a large um, research project that looks at um, discharge planning. Um, so the sort of hospital disability interface. And we're also um, doing some uh, scoping review and looking at some administrative data, um, which focuses on the primary health needs and service utilization of people with disability. Um, so I'll just sort of rapidly go through, um, touch on some of the research we're doing, but it's worth knowing that we do have, um, every six months we provide a report on our website that provides an update of, of all the research we're doing and the progress of all the projects. Um, so, so far we've published um, four scoping literature reviews. So one was specifically on young people in aged care. We've um, published one on housing, one on the, that looks at the quality of um, paid disability supports, um, one on smart home technology, and we're currently working on one on um, discharge planning and also um, a scoping literature review that focuses on primary, um, primary health and people with disability. So our analysis of administrative data, we've partnered, mostly partnered with other organisations so that we can complete that work in a really timely way. Um, and so we ha um, have um, completed some work in partnership with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, and we have another project that we're shaping up um, around the pathways in and out of aged care for younger people. Um, we've partnered with Monash, Monash University, um, the University of New South Wales, University of Wollongong, um, and also an organisation called uh, Outcome Health, which um, uh, has access to a lot of um, uh, primary health data um, from, from PHNs. Um, and then our other area of research, primary research. Uh, so we are um, doing a lot of um, range of sort of primary research. So we're about to publish, um, uh, I'll finish, finalise a manuscript around the evaluation of participant-led videos, um, which is around improving the quality of support um, that people with disability receive. Um, probably our largest project at the moment is around discharge planning, with, which has, at the moment we have 218 participants across nine hospital sites. Um, another really large project where we're starting to get a um, significant number of participants is looking at tenant outcomes from um, uh, special disability accommodation and then some other projects that are kind of just um, just starting off. Um, so that kind of covers our most of our research program um, and I guess just to give you a, some ideas of what is next where we're um, starting a program that looks at um, housing market data. So we've been producing um, supply um, reports around SDA. Um, so we're about to uh, about to produce our fourth supply report, but we um, we're start going to start regularly producing reports around the supply and demand data. So we'll look at, we'll glean, take that data from um, some from the um, data that the NDIA provides, but we've also got data from our tenancy matching service which has helped um, 300 people to connect with um, new housing options. 
um, and a lot of data from our housing hub. And we'll also continue to do um, surveys of different stakeholders um, in the SDA market. Um, the other kind of recent work that we've been doing in collaboration with, with um, Bruce um, and Melbourne University and, and Deakin University is around um, creating an evidence base to influence the building code for all housing in Australia. So we um, produced three really timely reports um, uh, recently in the last few months, um, but there's still a lot of work to kind of get across the line to um, make all housing in Australia um, more accessible. So last week we launched a campaign called Building Better Homes. So this campaign is determined to see minimum accessible standards included in the building code and ensure the code meets the needs of all Australians. So um, we, yeah, it's kind of early days, but we've already established a terrific number of partnerships. And so I guess just briefly, we'd love um, your support. We'd love um, for you to join the coalition of organisations um, um, on the kind of Building Better Homes campaign. So you can go to our, our new website, um, also sign the petition and encourage people to email um, ministers and your local MP. Um, contact me if you would um, like to be kind of part of that campaign or um, contribute in, in any way. And I guess just the final thing is that um, we, um, you know, we, we're starting to design an evidence base for the Building Better Homes kind of um, campaign because we can see that um, there's going to be another level of evidence needed when we um, come to sort of sit down and be able to kind of negotiate um, the priorities around accessible housing. There's going to be, well, we know there's significant resistance from the, um, the building sector around any change to the building code. So we really want a concrete evidence base. So we've got a um, prioritise lists of what accessible elements will make the biggest difference um, to the lives of people with disability and seniors. And also, um, we, we also need a really clear evidence base to understand what are the um, the different costs associated with incorporating each of these elements into the new, new houses, apartments and townhouses. And we kind of think this, this evidence base is gonna be really critical to make um, kind of informed decisions about um, negotiating uh, with federal government and the, um, and the Australian Building Codes Board uh, early next year. So that's gonna be, um, yeah, I guess it's a unique opportunity. And if, I guess if we don't, take the opportunity um, to change the building code now, we probably won't have another, uh, another chance for another 10 years. So um, yeah, really welcome any um, support um, anyone's able to provide with, with that campaign. And I'm done, Chris. That's fantastic, thank you. I, I, think, I think your organisation is, is an example of a, of a really focused targeted research agenda but also having the sort of uh, the the agility to move quickly which um, often universities don't have so um, you sort of combine all those skills um, there's a couple of questions and we've got about five minutes sort of left before I just do a quick roundup um, and I guess somebody's saying is the data that you're using is it data is it national or is it state-based? And I might add to that and ask both you and Bruce about the issues of ethics and data linkage. Like, how do you get over some of that? There's very little, there's been very little data linkage to date. And most of that has been in New South Wales, but how do you get over the issues of ethics and data linkage? Um, which is, it's obviously a very important strategy for research, but you know, we haven't got the, the ethical sort of regime in place across Australia to manage that. Yep. So just in terms of like state or national, so most of our research would be um, national. I, get, I, I guess apart from administrative data, which we are doing on a state by state basis. So we've got one project we've done in um, looking at Victorian hospitals and another project with New South Wales hospitals. Um, but um, yeah, and I guess the data linkage, we are, um, it just, it takes a long time um, to kind of bring the data custodians together. We are 
um, I guess our first data linkage project will be um, looking at an established kind of a, a data set around primary health and um, using data linkage to identify NDIS participants within that data set. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, we, yeah, which and when we and we've got ethics to to, to do that. So um, it is uh, it is complicated, but it can be done, and it and it's really worthwhile. And I'm, I guess I'm really excited about this project because I think I don't think we know enough about um, the primary health needs and um, utilization of people with disability, and why we're interested in it is because we um, know that if young people move out of aged care, unless their primary health needs are adequately met in a really proactive way, they're going to tip back into hospital and potentially um, back, back into aged care. Mm. I, I also wonder about issues of consent. So, you know, uh, that data is potentially identifiable from individual to record. Um, but Bruce, do you have anything to add about um, that? Look, I think, I mean, I mean a lot of work is, is now underway on, on, on that whole issue of, of I guess, guess both ethics and data safety okay so I mean you'd be aware that there has been this sort of five safes uh, sort of framework developed you know it's it's about you know which requires you know safe data storage safe data safe projects safe people safe use um, you know and, and you know as part of that you know I think it's important to to recognize that I think what we're talking about here is de-identified data and then publication of data that is not identifiable. So, you know, there's a great focus in this work on making sure that, um, you know, that you don't publish data where you can clearly identify who, who's, you know, who it relate, relates to. But it's, it's, it's a developing area in Australia. I think we have the advantage of being able to learn from other countries that are further advanced in this, you know, New Zealand, um, Canada. And, and I think it's also really important to be clear about what the purpose of data linkage should is, you know, and I think in the case of people with disabilities, it has to be for the you know, for the benefit of people with disabilities and their families and carers. And so I think that that um, sort of overarching principle needs to be applied very, very clearly. Otherwise, um, as I think you're alluding to, the data can be used for purposes that would actually be quite damaging and we don't want to see that happen. Mm. But I think that's true of all research, that, that there has to be a purpose behind for research. I'm going to have to, I think we have to draw to a close because David's just warned me that the, the webinar might finish automatically at five o'clock, which would be disastrous. Um, so I'd just like to thank the members of the panel for participating today. Um, I think we've sort of ranged over quite a, a lot of areas, but there's been a sort of common theme about the significance of research and knowledge uh, to bringing about social change and particularly how people with acquired brain injury need that research and advocacy and the same for people with intellectual disabilities, probably more so than other groups. Um, I just want to say the thank you very much everybody for participating in our research seminars this year and we'll be running another series next year and the first seminar will be on the 10th of February. So there's a pattern to the dates. It's always the second Wednesday of the month, which happens to coincide with Latrobe Academic Board. So I tend to spend all day chairing meetings. Um, and we've got, we haven't set the program yet, but we will be sending that out over the period of time. Uh, we're hoping that uh, a visiting person from overseas who was actually visiting last year and has had to stay, um, who was the chief social worker for adult services, uh, adult disability services in the UK, uh, will talk at the first seminar about an initiative uh, they developed in the UK around a named social worker for everybody with an intellectual disability. So um, that was evaluated and that will be a really interesting presentation. And I'm also very hopeful that in at that first seminar, or if not then the March one, we will be able to launch our newly created uh, 
practice leadership resources, which are training resources for the field, which have been funded by the NDIS Safeguarding Commission that we're just about to finalise. Um, and there's a there's a whole range of other presentations that are will come from P from our PhD students and from the finalisation of a number of research projects. And we'll also be holding um, a roundtable to uh, bring together all the research that's been done over the last since our last roundtable actually around supported decision making um, early in the new year to hopefully contribute to the thinking of the NDIS and to inject the sort of uh, both national and international research perspective into that thinking. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. If you're not on our mailing list, please send us an email and we'll add you to the list. Uh, if you are on the list, you'll, you'll get some information about um, our first seminar for next year. Um, so put it in your diaries. It's the 10th of February. I hope everybody has a good break. I think it's incredibly well earned this year. <laughs> Most of us are suffering from exhaustion and uh, we'll come back renewed next year. So thank you very much again. Um, and we'll see you in the new year. Okay. Bye-bye.